Oral questions by members. Leader of the official opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the NDP government's and this Premier's reckless experiment to decriminalize heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, fentanyl, coupled with their further experiment to flood communities with highly addictive so-called safe supply drugs has utterly failed. It has made our communities and streets unsafe, it has made addictions worse, and has led to the highest number of overdose deaths ever in the history of British Columbia. Recent notable police seizures have uncovered thousands of highly addictive, dangerous government drugs that are being diverted from the NDP's so-called safe supply and funneled directly into our streets and schools. So my question to the Premier, when will the Premier end his failed program of highly addictive, taxpayer-supplied drugs and this reckless decriminalization program? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. And, uh, uh, happy to, uh, to, to respond to the member's question here. We, of course, have canvassed this uh, question quite thoroughly in, uh, in budget estimates. And again, I will note that just to provide the context for the way in which this program evolved, it was as a response to what is an unprecedented crisis that not only our province is experiencing, but every other jurisdiction across the country, right across the United States, across the, our continent, we have a crisis that is brought by fentanyl, by fentanyl poisoning the illicit drug supply. That is what our uh, prescribed alternatives program attempts to provide one tool to try to address, to separate people from the toxic drug supply. And the early uh, evidence uh, from uh, uh, people's access to this program, in fact, is showing a reduction in mortality. We are very concerned, of course, we share the concern around ensuring that this program is managed appropriately, that it's meeting its, its stated objectives, and that we address any uh, unintended um, impacts of, of how this program is operating, and that's why we've taken action to do that, Honourable Speaker. We have put in place provisions with health authorities, with frontline providers, through our guidelines to mitigate uh, and reduce uh, the risk of uh, diversion of medications that are available under this program. We will continue to do that important work with our partners, including our law enforcement par partners with whom we work uh, regularly. Leader of the Official Opposition, Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's evident to the entire public that, of course, this is a crisis. The problem is the results we're getting are clearly not working. That's why on this side of the House we've said the focus needs to be on treatment and recovery from addiction. That has to be the priority of all governments. But this NDP government and this Premier stubbornly refuse to face the reality that this reckless so-called safe supply of highly addictive drugs coupled with the NDP's decriminalization disaster, have only fueled an already bad situation. Police are sounding the alarm, public patience is running out, and thousands of highly addictive, taxpayer-funded drugs are being diverted into our neighbourhoods and our children's schools. Whether it's SkyTrain or coffee shops or playgrounds, nowhere feels safe anymore. And this NDP government have modeled this reckless program on the decriminalization experiment that took place in Oregon, where they have looked in horror at the utter failure of this decriminalization experiment and thankfully are backpedaling to get away from the huge mistake they made. So my question to the minister is how many more police notable drug seizures do we have to see? How many more lost lives do we have to see? before government will admit their failure of this reckless decriminalization program and get back to treating people who are trying to fight their addictions. Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. And, uh, you know, one thing that this House, that all, all parties agree to in this House, with the exception of the, of the Conservatives, uh, who didn't exist at the time that the Health Standing Committee was struck and met um, uh, for several months over the course of, uh, of 2022 to investigate, to look at what could we do collectively 
to, to combat the toxic drug crisis. And everybody in this House agreed. The other side agreed, we agreed, the Greens agreed, everyone agreed that we needed to do everything that we could. We needed to use every tool in our toolbox to try to keep people alive so that we can connect them to care. That was agreed to by everyone. Safer supply was agreed to by everyone. Decrim was agreed to by everyone. All of the provisions, uh, all of the recommendations, it was a unanimous report. Everyone agreed until, until, Honourable Speaker, we had the emergence of the Conservative Party who took a different view, Members. and then we started to see the Members. opposition walk back on their view. I will say we all agree that we need treatment. We all agree that every path should be about supporting people. has to be about supporting people on wellness, supporting people to recover. That's why we just announced the opening of 180 beds, 180 beds, which is the size of Langley Memorial Hospital. That's why we announced 28 youth shelter beds Member. that will also provide treatment at, 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 um, at down at Covenant, Covenant House. That's why we just announced a $117 million investment Thank to you. support the treatment and recovery sector, Honourable Speaker. Thank we you. are all about providing treatment and support to British Columbians. Thank you. Leader of the Official Opposition, second supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and well, good try, Minister. But the fact of the matter is, what that all party committee said was, for goodness sakes, don't go ahead with this reckless experiment unless you're going to have guardrails in place, unless you're going to keep that in place. But no. They had to charge ahead without any of those guardrails, without any of the data that the federal government asked them to collect so that we could determine whether this is actually working. And the bottom line is it has been a total failure. And that's why in communities like Chinatown, they consider, they continue, excuse me, to suffer from the rampant open drug use, the social chaos, and the unchecked crime which is caused by the policies of this soft on crime NDP government. Just yesterday, prolific offender Larry Carlston was caught defacing Chinatown with racist graffiti and faced absolutely no consequences as, incredibly, the hate crime charges were unbelievably dropped by Crown prosecutors. Chinatown Business Improvement Association President Jordan Ang said it best, and I quote, after what this community has gone through over the last couple of years, the hate crimes, the graffiti, the attacks against Chinese seniors, this isn't a just punishment." End of quote. So my question to the minister, how much more do communities like Chinatown have to suffer before this soft on crime NDP government with their lawlessness and their reckless experiment with decriminalization of dangerous drugs have to continue punishing that community and other communities right across the province. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am a, a Vancouver MLA. Um, my my uh, riding borders Chinatown. It's my community. It's a beautiful part of my community, Chinatown. It's something that we not only value, but we're actively investing in. Um, we have launched the put money into the, the Canadian, the first ever Chinese Canadian Museum in that um, community. We are, we are, we are making sure that that community is not only celebrated, but their stories are collected for all time. Mr. Speaker, we have a very proud history of working with the, uh, with the Chinese community and Chinatown, and we'll continue to do that work. Thank you. Member for Surrey South. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. The problem is with some of the street disorder and chaos we're seeing in places like Chinatown, people are too scared to go to museums. In fact, I think that there was an attack downtown on a Crown prosecutor that made even Crown prosecutors afraid to go to their own workplace. The reality is, is that this is a taxpayer-funded drug crisis and a public safety emergency, Mr. Speaker. RCMP officers in Prince George say so-called safe supply and decriminalization are to blame for rise in violent gang crimes. Quote, we've noticed an increase in a lot of drug trafficking to support the open drug use. 
and a lot of changes over the last one to one and a half years, end quote. But while this government-funded drug supply floods our streets, the Premier is busy denying there's even a problem. As this crisis deepens and spreads, when will the Premier acknowledge the dire consequences of his policies and stop the flow of highly addictive, taxpayer-funded drugs? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, and, and just to put this in context, you know, we have in British Columbia about 100, 101,000 uh, people who um, are, are thought to be uh, have a diagnosis of, uh, of opioid use disorder. We have, you know, fewer than about 4,500 individuals who at any time are accessing the pharmaceutical alternatives program. It's a very, very small amount of people who are accessing this program and accessing a very small um, percentage of total sort of uh, medications um, uh, that are prescribed for pain. If we're talking about Dilaudid, for example, 86% of the Dilaudid prescribed in the province is um, in fact prescribed for people with cancer, for seniors dealing with arthritis, for people who are being discharged from, from hospital. So uh, I, I want to reiterate um, that, uh, Honourable Speaker, that this is one tool that we have, an important tool in our toolbox, and it is a tool that in fact this House agreed was an important program to continue to provide that the other side agreed in the Health Standing Committee that this was a valuable tool. We all agreed we are committed to continue to provide this program and to provide it in a way that supports the prescribers, that supports people Members. in working with uh, all of our partners. Members. We are absolutely uh, committed to doing the work to make sure that this program Thank is you. provided in an appropriate way. Thank you. Members. Member Nett, let's not interrupt others when they're talking, please. Floor is for Sri South. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. As we heard in that last answer from the Minister, talking about a small amount, small amount of people, we heard from another Minister talk about it's not widespread. This is just this government continually trying to minimize a problem, yes. a problem that's causing population-level damage in British Columbia. So how widespread, I must ask, must it get before it deserves this Premier's attention? Absolutely. And it's not just, the sh there is no shortage of ways that this Premier allows taxpayer-funded drugs. We've seen not just one, not two, but four reported seizures of taxpayer-funded, government-provided drugs across this province now. And under the NDP, drug dealers aren't just getting taxpayer-funded drugs from this government, they're getting taxpayer-funded hotel rooms too. In uh, the RCMP and Prince George say that at the Knights Inn, leased by BC Housing, half of the rooms, half of the rooms in the building were being used to deal drugs. When will the Premier admit this is a failure and end his reckless experiment with highly addictive, taxpayer-funded drugs and decriminalization? <laughs> Minister. Honourable Speaker. What our government will not minimize is the impact of the toxic drug crisis on British Columbians. We will not minimize the 2,539 lives that were lost last year, the, the, the devastating impact and the toll that it takes on families and communities. And the, and the need that we have, not only in British Columbia, but across the country, to find solutions, to work together in community to find solutions. Honourable Speaker, we are not the only province experiencing this devastation. Members. Next door in Alberta, they have seen a 25% increase in mortality. In Saskatchewan, a 30% increase in mortality associated with this public health emergency. We have to continue to treat this problem as a public health emergency and provide people with the access to the care and support that they need, and that includes this program. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Yesterday I asked about continued logging of BC's increasingly rare old-growth forests. Today let's look at where some of these old-growth trees are ending up. The UK company Drax says its wood pellets are, quote, sustainable and legally harvested. 
However, documents from the Ministry of Forest show that Drax continues to source whole logs from BC's old growth forests, more than 40,000 tons in 2023 to be exact. One example is cut block EM807M outside of Prince George. It was classified as a priority deferral area by the technical advisory panel, and yet somehow Drax received 130 truckloads of whole logs from this site. The old growth was then turned into pellets, shipped overseas, and burned. Truly, nothing could be worse for the climate than this. Because of the Ministry's policies, old growth and primary forests in BC remain at risk, and somehow Drax is getting access to BC's primary forests and ancient trees. My question is to the Minister of Forests. Will he use his powers to prohibit the logging of old growth for wood pellets? Minister of Forests. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, more harvest resi residue and fire damaged wood is being used for economic purposes, such as wood pellets. And there is market demand for wood pellets for cleaner energy sources. And, uh, and it, it spans uh, BC's exports as well. But there is, I think, a bit of a misconception here. Not all harvested logs are suitable for sawmills. Some are too small and have been badly damaged by insects or wildfire. Some pellet mills use a small number of damaged, small or low quality logs, but that was less than 1% of the total provincial harvest over the last five years leading up to 2001. And in fact, it would not be economic for any pellet company to use quality logs to produce pellets. In 2022, pellet mills paid up to $35 a cubic meter for fiber sourced from residual harvesting piles, or sometimes called slash. An interior saw log was valued at about $132 a cubic meter at a lumber facility, and pulp logs are valued at $53 a community uh, per cubic meter. To get the most revenue for each grade of log, these logs would be sold or traded to mills w willing to pay a higher price. Leader of the Third Party Supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The Minister skirted right around my question just the way his ministry is skirting around the deferrals that were put in place by the Technical Advisory Panel's report. This province continues to operate as a resource colony, exporting raw materials. We're a company town. They hand our irreplaceable forests to the highest bidder, often multinational companies that take the profit and run, leaving forestry-dependent communities in the dust. As a result, BC forestry industry is in a state of crisis. Yesterday, BC's three main forestry unions raised the alarm. They called out the inadequacy of this government's response, which has been to announce small ad hoc assistance programs delivered with little attention to the need for an overall strategy to sustain the, in the industry. Experts and advocates have been clear on what's needed. Why has the province failed to listen? My question is to the Minister of Forests. We need value-added manufacturing for BC's forests, not more wood pellets and shuttered mills. Why are our primary forests being cut down and turned into wood pellets when this government promised a paradigm shift and a value-added forestry industry? Minister of Forests. Thank you very much uh, uh, to the member for the question. Uh, yesterday, there, there indeed was a forest summit uh, hosted by three forest unions. Uh, the Premier spoke there, I spoke there, and the Minister for Sustainable Forest Innovation also spoke there. Uh, they have produced a report which offers some, I think, very real solutions. They are solutions-oriented. We will study that report and follow up. But let me say that uh, in dealing particularly with value-added, we have initiated a new program uh, that will uh, uh, give a special access to Crown Timber to value-added companies and to them alone. Uh, others will be uh, not permitted to, to bid on that timber. And the value-added program is expanded. It's been well received by the value-added sector and indeed it will generate the kind of uh, jobs of value-added products that are destined for use in British Columbia and North America and for export overseas. And uh, we think that's a very valuable addition to the forest industry in British Columbia. Thank you. House Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
Our NDP Premier admits that BC has an anti-Semitism anti problem. However, it is this Premier who allowed anti-Semitism to spread unchecked in his caucus, his Premier's office and his BC NDP party. If the Premier is looking for a cause of anti-Semitism, he ought to go look in the mirror. During his tenure as Attorney General, this Premier allowed Victoria, BC's extreme imam, Yumus Kathrata, to announce death threats to Jewish people from the pulpit of his Victoria Mosque for the last six years. This Premier's inaction spoke loud and clear. Another video was released just yesterday, Mr. Speaker. Kathrata calling Jews apes and pigs, vermin, and praying for their annihilation to his over 25,000 followers on Facebook. Mr. Speaker, enough's enough. Question to the Attorney General of British Columbia. Will this NDP government support police to bring charges of hate crimes against Yumas Kathrata and appoint a special prosecutor for anti-Semitism, yes or no? Attorney General. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. Of course, we condemn hateful comments and anti-Semitic comments by people everywhere in this province. And of course, as Attorney General, I will do what I can to make the systems ready to receive those reports and to take action on them. Mr. Speaker, I recently wrote um, the BC Prosecution Service has updated their hate crime policy to specifically note anti-Semitism in there. I recently wrote, wrote to Minister Varani uh, federally to speak specifically about changes to the criminal code that could help clarify that there's no defense of truth for denial of the Holocaust, which is pretty clear. We will make sure that all of our enforcement and decision makers in this matter have what they need to, to, to go after hate crime to the fullest extent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Leader, Fourth Party Supplemental. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would say for one of the former members of your caucus, it's too little too late. Will this Premier admit to his mistakes and apologize to the Jewish community and to all British Columbians for allowing anti-Semitism and hate to infiltrate his Premier's office, his caucus and his NDP party? Government House Leader. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker, and uh, we've canvassed this issue for the last few days. Uh, every member of this chamber uh, condemns anti-Semitism, condemns hate in any form, Honourable Speaker. We must work together to ensure that we're taking this on uh, uh, head on. Honourable Speaker, uh, the Premier's actions have been clear. Octor October 7th was horrific, had a statement out on that day, um, Honourable Speaker. We know also that uh, the days after, October 27th, in fact, a Premier statement was made in this House. Not only that, Honourable Speaker, November 15th, we launched the uh, helpline, the crisis line. Um, uh, we, on November 28th, we announced additional security funding for communities that felt threatened. Uh, Honourable Speaker, February 16th, a new prosecution service policy was put in place so that we can prosecute hate crimes, Honourable Speaker. We take this very seriously, Honourable Speaker. We're going to continue to do that work, work with all partners that are feeling uh, afraid, uh, feeling attacked. We want to make sure British Columbia remains a place where people can come and feel safe. Members, House Leader of uh, Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, the, the Premier has taken this issue of anti-Semitism so seriously, he hasn't bothered to actually focus on his own government, his own caucus, and his own party. Exactly. That's hardly taking this, uh, this seriously. In fact, the Premier fired his former cabinet minister, a minister within his government, who was actually calling to attention anti-Semitism and rising anti-Semitism. Uh, at the same time, the Premier's hand-picked ADM for anti-racism has openly expressed anti-Semitic views. This double standard sends a chilling message that anti-Semitism is tolerated by this Premier within his government caucus and party. Now, Mr. Speaker, in our schools, Jewish students are facing horrific anti-Semitic abuse. One student says, and I quote, 
Kids in my school shout things at me like, Hail Hitler and Hamas for life, end quote. In another incident, a student says, and I quote, in my science class, my teacher said that Jews are genocidal murderers, end quote. That's in an elementary, or that's in a science class in a high school. This obviously demands an independent review. Will the Premier do the right thing and commit to fully in, uh, investigating in an independent manner the rising anti-Semitism, not just within our schools, but also again within his government, within his caucus, and within his party? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to be clear, along with all of my colleagues here today, that I'm sure we stand in solidarity on, that, on this. Every child deserves to feel safe and included in their school environment. Hateful comments like the ones noted are unacceptable and should be rooted out. I want to make it clear to everybody that if you are hearing or seeing something, please report it to your principal. There's also an online erase uh, website where you can report anonymously if that's something that um, you don't feel comfortable coming forward with it. Our commitment is to make sure that all students feel safe in their schools so they can learn and thrive. And Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do the work to make sure that that's possible. House Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, what the public wants to see, what the Jewish community wants to see is action, not more empty words from this uh, government. Shockingly, we're weeks into canvassing this uh, uh, in this House, and to this day, this, the Premier still will not even acknowledge the anti-Semitic history of the ADM that he handpicked to lead the anti-racism file within government. Now, I've got to be uh, right, straight up here, Mr. Speaker. When, when I'm, I'm back home and I'm, I'm answering questions about this, and I have people that come up to me and say, how is it possible that an ADM for anti-racism who holds anti-Semitic views that are publicly known, how is it possible that that person is in charge of that file and advising government? This cannot be true. My only response to them is it is true, it's outrageous, and I, it, it's unbelievable that the, the Premier would allow this to happen. Now, while the pr Premier sets a double standard in firing the former senior minister, no action has been taken to address anti-Semitic slogans in our schools. In one case, an elementary class did an art project invoking, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. This re re references an explicit call by Hamas to murder all Jews by driving them into the sea. Jewish students and teachers do not feel safe. It's ridiculous for the Premier to believe it's appropriate Question to investigate number. himself. When is the Premier going to launch a fully independent investigation into his government and his caucus, schools, and the NDP party with respect to rampant anti-Semitism? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Um, the member is right that we have canvassed this uh, issue. Um, we take this very seriously. We take any form of hate very seriously, Honourable Speaker. That's why one of the first things we did when we formed government was bring back a Human Rights Commission. It's one of the first things that we did as a government. Why? Because we knew this independent body was needed to ensure that all forms of hate, all forms of discrimination get a spotlight on them. Why a government would get rid of that, I don't know, Honourable Speaker. But we felt it was important, especially given that we were the only jurisdiction in the country that didn't have that. We launched an anti-racism strategy, Honourable Speaker, to root out systemic racism within our communities. I personally travelled the province working on this issue. I can tell you that what we heard was the way you address these issues is by strengthening the fabric of our communities through education. That's why we have Holocaust education in our schools, Honourable Speaker. We know this is important work. We have to continue to do this work. We want to make sure British Columbia remains a safe place for everyone in British Columbia. Member for, member for Abbotsford West. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The challenge that people are having are reconciling the words with the actions. We have the compelling testimony 
in a heartfelt letter from a former senior member of that government saying she felt abandoned in calling for attention to a rising tide of anti-Semitism. We have the comments of an assistant deputy minister in charge of anti-racism that says precisely the opposite, conveys precisely the opposite of what this government says it intends to stand for. We have evidence of a government when confronted by systemic racism in other circumstances, taking the steps that the public and we felt appropriate. But when it hits close to home, when the allegations are politically inconvenient or embarrassing, the government refuses to do the right thing. What we have not heard, despite all the rhetoric, despite all of the attempts to sidestep the issue, is why this government and this premier won't take the logical step and order an independent inquiry into all of these incidents of racism, including the allegations that stem from the heart of the government itself, the cabinet and the caucus. Why won't this government and this premier do the logical thing and order that independent inquiry? Honourable Speaker, uh, the member speaks about taking actions to address racism and hate. So we, since we formed government, that's what we've been doing. Uh, the member, I appreciate the member's asking a question, but members should also explain why did they get rid of a Human Rights Commission, independent body that was there to address this issue throughout society? Because we have a tribunal, they said, Honourable Speaker, a clear misunderstanding of what the difference between a tribunal is and a human rights commission. Members, shh. members, member, 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 for, member, please, let, let him answer. We can disagree with him if we want to, but let him answer. Let him complete, please. Honourable Speaker, a human rights commission, an independent, by the way, the only independent human rights commission in all of North America. Honourable Speaker, um, an anti-racism strategy. We um, additional uh, education around Holocaust in schools. Honourable Speaker, a helpline, additional security funding for communities that are feeling unsafe. Honourable Speaker, you know, I'll, t I'll say this, Honourable Speaker. Members, uh, members, please, members, members, conclude, please. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I think uh, everyone. Uh, in British Columbia, my colleagues, all of us are horrified around what happened on October 7th. All of us are horrified at what happened on October 7th. We know that there's fear. Members. Honourable Speaker, this is, uh, this is a serious topic. I don't know why the opposition continues to heckle. Not, that was a question. Yeah. Answering the members, members, question has been asked. Answer is being provided. You can disagree with the answer, but the answer is going to be given what the House Leader wants to give, okay? Please, let's, let's let him conclude. M member, please. Honorable please conclude. Speaker, during difficult times, when people are afraid, when people need leadership, that's the time when you bring communities together, Honorable Speaker. That's when you bring people together. That's why you engage with them, Honorable Speaker. That's what we're doing with the Jewish community. That's what we're doing with uh, the Muslim community who is facing a rise in uh, Islamophobia, Honorable Speaker. We continue to do that work, Honorable Speaker, because we want to make sure everyone has a safe place uh, that they can call home in British Columbia.